Colossians chapter 3, we come to verse 15 through 17 today, how to live in the peace of God. Now, as you remember, as we headed into chapter 3, it's now no longer on justification, how a person comes to be saved, but as a saved person, how do we become the vessel of God for his glory, why we live on earth, you know? Uh, We live on earth for another day, a year, I don't know, 10 years, I I don't know how long the Lord has. But in that time before I go to meet the Lord, as it says in John, we don't want to shrink away in shame at his appearing because we haven't been abiding in him or bearing good fruit. We don't want to be the guy that gets one talent, you know, some get 10, some get five. We don't want to be the guy with one talent and say, uh, oh, here it is, Lord, I wrapped it up and buried it in the ground and here it is back. And he's like, well, why didn't you just put it in the, the bank to get a little interest on it, you know? And, and again, he didn't fare well at the, at the judgment because he wasn't being the sanctified person, sanctified, set apart for God's use. And so we as believers don't want to just believe and then say, I'm saved. We now want to be disciples. That's what he told the apostles. Go into all the world and make disciples, people that will follow, people that will continue to learn and grow and seek me. That we hear through the Psalms where David's like, when you said, seek my face, my soul said, your face, O oh Lord, will I seek, right? That's the heart of a believer. And so we saw what is this sanctified person? He's one who gets his eyes on Jesus, we learned. He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. We need to put to death sexual sin because the only sex God's ordained is in marriage. Anything outside of that is unclean, impure. It will grieve the spirit. It'll quench the spirit. It will personally harm you like no other sin. It's in its own category. Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage is honorable among all. Every civilization, no matter what the civilization is, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And so I I realize as we live in Sodom, Gomorrah, it seems like no big deal. Everybody's got their sexual sins and we just don't talk about it openly and, and God doesn't care because we're rich and we're doing well and look at how prosperous, look at how great city we have here in Sodom and Gomorrah and, and it, it appears like God doesn't care. God's not thinking differently than the average man is thinking. thinking. But in reality, the day of judgment is going to come and God has made it abundantly clear from the beginning to the end of the Bible that sex is a powerful thing for marriage to bind people together to make them one. And um, <clears throat> then we learned about things that we just got to constantly put off. Sexual sins, put it to death. Now all this stuff to put off. We learned about that anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy language, put it out of your mouth. And now put on things that are renewed in the image of Jesus. That's it. You you see, so many people say, oh, okay, if you're going to be deeper, it's all about you being holy. So I need to look holy. I need to dress holy. That's why the the monks begin to wear ugly robes, tattered wool robes. Can't see my body. I can't can't look at my body and it's vanity. Other people can't see my body and, and be attracted to it. I'm going to shave the back of my head and make a bald spot so my hair is not attractive, and I'm not attractive, and I'm going to go live in a cave or go live in a monastery, and while I'm in there, man, I'm going to get on my knees for hours, and, and I'm going to hit myself with the whip and, and, and tell God I'm so sorry for hours a day and repent, and, and then I'm going to eat food that's not tasty at all, no sugar, no salt, just, just blah, and, and I'm just going to hide away from the culture and be holy, 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 holy all day long in my little cubicle in this monastery. It couldn't be farther from the truth. God wants us to be in the world, not of it. And it's not about you burning candles and you looking in the mirror going, you were were holy today more than you were yesterday. It's about relationships. 
It's not about me not being angry. It's about me not being angry towards my brother, hurting our relationship. And so you say, Jesus was invited to the weddings. Jesus was invited to the parties. Jesus was always the, the one that the multitudes flocked to and wanted to be near. Why? Because Jesus put off anger and malice and blasphemy. And he put on what? It tells us there are tender mercies, not anger, but tender mercies, not wrath and malice, but kindness, not blasphemy and filthy language, but humility and meekness and long suffering. And then last week, we looked at the final three there in verse 13 and 14, put on bearing with one another. What? Put on what? Where you just, nothing is going to cause you not to connect in the body of Christ with one another. <clears throat> Newsflash, some people come from a very difficult place. They, they were raised by a pack of wolves. <laughs> they were raised in a very dark home or maybe a very lazy home or a drunken home or a drug addicted home or in, in a neighborhood where there are a lot of gangs. And when they come to Christ, they've never really connected with people. In their neighborhood, if you're nice, that means you're going to be the next Mark. <laughs> if you don't beat up a guy who just mouthed against you, they're going to beat you up next week. Some people just come out of homes where they, they've been scarred, maybe by being molested, maybe by being mistreated in an alcoholic home, and they, and they don't really know how to function and we say, we don't care where you've been. We don't care how, what deep a hole you come out of. We're going to grab onto you and we're going to bear all things. We're going to believe all things. We're going to endure all things. We're going to keep loving you and loving you. And you're going to love me until we're both coming to the image of Christ. Until we walk as Jesus walked more often than we don't. And so, hey, brother, that was... That was hurtful what you just said. As believers, we want to be kind and merciful and loving towards one another. You see, it's all about that relationship. And so we want to be bearing with one another. What's the next thing we looked at last week? Forgiving one another just as Christ forgave us. Boy, that would be a 10 sermon if we went into all the ways Christ loves us so deeply, so perfectly, so completely, so Confidently, securely. So put on love. That's, that's it. Really, we don't need to mention anything else. If you understand the love of Jesus, then you, you know all about his kindness and mercy and love and gentleness, etc. And so we've been looking at this first part of Colossians up to verse 14 about character. What's the disciple's character? What's the What's the person who's following Jesus' character? Well, it's just like God's character, just like Jesus' character. But now we're going to look at conduct. What's the conduct of a disciple or the doing? What am I supposed to be doing? And now he's going to tell us in verse 15 through 17. What are we to be doing? We're to let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in which also you were called into one body, and be thankful. What's the next thing we need to do? Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What else are we be doing? Verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name or the nature or in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Even here on the things we're to be doing, it's not what you would expect. You need to start doing this. You've got to get up at four in the morning and, and fast and pray until seven. And, and then you, you know, you know, this. And somehow it, it, it requires me to be on my knees and be bloody and hate life and, and striving. And, you know, if you look, if you look at Christianity, it uniquely blends 
with living a life like everybody else is living. I don't need to carry a rug around like the Muslims and put it out and face east and five times a day pray for an hour. I don't need to wear a special necklace that has beads on it and where I, you know, Hail Mary full of grace or Hare Krishna Rama Rama. I, you know, I don't have a special haircut that's going to separate me or a special robe or a special bunch of beads or necklaces or jewelry or something on me that I can use to remind me to be holy. We're, we're just to be in the world like the world, but not of the world. They're angry. We're at peace. They're, they're bad-mouthing somebody. We're full of love and kindness and forgiveness and mercy and grace. They're critical and fine-faulting and judging. We're, we're going, no. They just need more love. We need to love them more, not condemn them more. You see, it just flows. And the world around us can see us weaving in amongst them. And they, all of us are like Jesus. Not one Jesus and, and Galilee cruising around, but a whole bunch of Jesus is everywhere. We are the light of the world as Jesus was the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth as Jesus was the salt of the earth. Sometimes salt stings, wounds. Sometimes it brings flavor to food. Sometimes it preserves meat. Salt has all kinds of reaction. Light too. Light when you're trying to see in a dark place is wonderful. Light first thing in the morning when you don't want to get out of bed is horrible. So sometimes our light is welcome. Sometimes our light is irritating. Sometimes our salt stings. Sometimes our salt heals. And so with Jesus. Jesus had a group of people that wanted to kill him, mostly religious people that were mad that he wasn't religious like them. <laughs> and so we, we, we come to, to realize, what are we to do? We're just to let it happen. Isn't that interesting? Here's what you're to do. Just let the peace of God flow, man. Let the word of God flow. Just don't hinder what God's spirit's doing. Isn't that interesting? It wasn't get up at five in the morning, pray for an hour, read the Bible, crawl on your knees for two miles and, and, and whip yourself for all the sins you committed yesterday. Burn a candle, go to a building, get a bead and give a hundred Hail Marys and our fathers. And it's just don't get in the way of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> just let it happen. God's spirit who lives in you is trying to direct you to prayer. Pray. Pray with your mind. Pray when your mind's unfruitful. Just meditate in the word. Just let it happen. God's spirit's going to bring it to, to mind and just let it happen. Let, let the Christian, let the love of Christ. Anger's going to be there like it was as a non-believer. But now we put it off and, and we just let the love that's already there through the spirit that lives in us, don't hinder it. Just let the love flow. Man, I, I, I would have punched a guy out two years ago for saying that. Now I just want to hug him and feel sorry for him and just, just want to pray for him. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. You know, it, it's hard sometimes for us to live like that because we don't have a lot of people living like that in our world. If there was a bunch of Christians standing strong at work, it would be easier for you to stand strong at work. If it was easier, if, if Christians in your neighborhood were standing out like Christ, it'd be easier for you. And so this is where we want to get in our discipleship, where we're bold, and we're not going to back down. I'm not going to get bold at the foghorn going, you sinner, repent. That's, that's how Hollywood sees Christianity, doesn't it? No, the guy gets out of his car mad because you cut him off. And you get out of your car and you're like, sorry, forgive me. I love you. I, I, in Jesus' name, take the anger from this guy's heart, Lord, and help me to drive in a way that doesn't anger people. 
Don't, don't, don't wimp out. Stand up. Be bold. Share Christ. Be, a, be that witness. Just let it happen. So what are the things that we are to be doing in our conduct? We're to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. We're to let the word of Christ richly dwell in us. And then we're to do everything in the name and the nature and the way Jesus would do it. Well, let's break this down in verse 15. It says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called into one body and be thankful. The peace of God rule into your hearts. For what purpose? So you look holier? So you're not full of anxiety and worry? Why am I to let the peace of God rule in my heart? So we as believers can be one. So as we as believers can be united. You, you, you guys understand that, right? When a group of people, even if it's just two or three, are truly for each other, in love truly united together, nothing we purpose will, not, will, will be withheld from us. Remember the Tower of Babel? They were wickedly standing against God, but they were unified. And God said, when men are unified, nothing they seek to do will, will be withheld from them. If that's true about the unbelieving world where God had to change their languages to scatter them, how true is that of believers where not only is it us and our spirits and our minds, but God's spirit and mind indwelling in us and as a group is there together with us. Unity is so important. But again, um, as you travel the world, you, you see people in the jungles. <laughs> they are unified. And when the gospel comes, they're immediately unified even more. And it's amazing how powerful they become. And so we as believers, the, the goal is to become in one body. Not me to be holier because I have the back of my head shaved and and I'm wearing ugly clothes, and I don't even have a mirror in my house because I'm not going to be vain. It's, you know, I'm, I, I, I lit four candles yesterday instead of one because that's just the kind of holy person I am. No, it's that, that I want this guy with me. I want you near me. I can't wait to go to church because I'm healed. I'm strengthened. This guy shares the word, what God's been speaking to him out of Psalms. And this guy shared with me what he's been reading out of Revelation. And this guy, God's heart stirred up about what he heard uh, about end times. And, and man, I, I just get, I get so strengthened. People washing me in the water of the word as I'm around them in Christ. Rule, the word rule is an interesting word. It's actually the word we would say umpire, the decider. <laughs> what is the decider in our life? It's the peace of God. And a peace that is there by faith, not by sight. So let, let, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of blow people's minds here, okay? Because I'm not going to teach this as a subjective thing, but an objective thing. You see, we, we have pretty much read this verse subjectively saying, oh, this is how you know the will of God. You have a peace. Oh, yeah. Oh, my heart, I have a peace. Or I don't have a peace. I, I don't have a peace. Now, sometimes is that true? I think as human beings, Christian or not, I think we, we have that ability. We sort of have a sixth sense. I, I haven't connected all the dots. I just don't feel comfortable doing that or not doing that. But as Christians, we, we attribute it to God. Oh, I've got this peace, and God's giving me that peace. Or I don't have a peace about it, and God's not giving me a peace about that. Is that true? I think so. I think that can be true. I just don't think that's what this verse is saying. I, I can tell you, I've heard ridiculous things in the name I have a peace from God. I mean, evil things. Evil things. I mean, I, I've, I've been told... Maybe 50, maybe 100 times, God gave me a peace to divorce my wife and marry my secretary. I, I've heard that so many times. Even though we've been married 20 years, I just no longer had a peace from God to stay married another day. 
ridiculous things. And I would say objectively, if you stay married, God will give you a peace. <laughs> if you don't marry, if you don't divorce your wife and don't marry your secretary, whether you feel the peace or not, the peace of God will be with you. Right? I mean, that's the whole point of walking by faith rather than by sight or by feelings. But boy, in America, we love this verse because we love living by our feelings. We've been trained through Hollywood, you know, at the end of the movie, movie is the music and, oh, and the sunset's perfect and the, and the lake is calm and they're in each other's arms kissing each other and, you know, the credits start flowing and, oh, that's love. I'm looking for that out there. We used to have that. Eh, not really. No, that was in your head for a week. <laughs> How do, we, how do we have the peace of God? I think in context, it's not about making personal decisions. The context is about relationships. It's peace between individuals that should be the umpire in our hearts. We have the peace of God that rules in us, not me. Let the peace of God rule in us here at Calvary Chapel Los Alamitos. Well, how do I do that? Well, let's go back. What do you need to put off? <laughs> the anger, the malice, the bad language coming out of your mouth. What do you do? You put on the, the fruits of the Spirit, really. And then you have peace. You know what? I, I, at work, it, it's a really difficult thing. But if I'm praying for them, and I'm being Jesus to them, even when they're mocking me, even when they're treating me harsh, even when they're not including me because I'm a Christian. Yet, I know I have the peace of God that I'm walking as Jesus would walk in that situation. Now, do I feel it all the time? No. Matter of fact, when they're like, hey, let's go to the bar and, and get a drink tonight. Hey, we're going to include you this time. Here's your opportunity. Oh, I got a peace. Yeah, I'm included. I'm accepted. Boy, it's powerful, isn't it? Being accepted is powerful. Being rejected is horribly painful. It's a scar that really doesn't heal. And to be a part of that group, I mean, I saw that when I went to college. There was a group of guys in my dorm that were right from the pit of hell, and they were literally dragging every Christian into Everything they shouldn't be doing, and most of those guys ended up not even making it through the first semester of college because they got them so distracted with the bar scene and the dancing scene and, and, uh, and doing something every night of the week, some party somewhere in town. Now that they're away from home and, you know, they're 18 or 19, they're, they're off. And, and I, I didn't move. By the grace of God, I, I did not move. And, and slowly, some of these Christians started coming back. Yeah, what are you doing this week, Brian? Man, I was just going to go sit by the beach and read my Bible and pray. And I was going to go to a Bible study. You want to go with me? So I understand the feelings of peace, being accepted. I don't even care what group it is. I just like to be invited whether I can go or not. Being rejected, I don't, even if it's a horrible group that I shouldn't be a part of, but I'm still being rejected by them, that messes with me. It hurts. So I, I, can't, I can't really say oh, I've got a peace, I don't have a peace, because our, our emotions are just all over the place, aren't they? But I know by faith I have the peace of God when I'm walking in the Spirit, right? When I'm putting to death the sexual things that rise and I have to fight almost daily. I know some Christian guys that they have very strong same-sex attractions. They've never given in to them. They're married, they have kids, but they still have those feelings very strongly from time to time. I know some guys that are married that are so dang good looking. And girls are just attracted. You go to lunch and everybody in the place is like, ah, oh. all the girls are like, man, if you look at me, I'm looking at you. Check me out. I'm checking you out. And he literally could have sex every day with a different beautiful woman that he, he, he doesn't entertain it. He doesn't allow it. He's put it to death. 
and being faithful to his wife. Does he have a peace in fighting his flesh like that? Probably not. But I've done what the Lord had me to do. I know I have the peace of God. And there's moments I feel it and I love it. But I have the peace because I know I'm walking in obedience the way the Lord would want me to live. So what do I do if I don't have peace? We go back, put off. You don't have peace? Put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language. You don't have peace? Put on the new man, which is in the image according to him who created us. Put off anger, wrath, malice. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness. And, and most of all, we looked at bearing with one another. You don't have a peace? You're, you're being rude to that person. You're cutting that person off. You're, you're, you're trying to avoid eye contact with that person at church or that other person in the workplace. Stop that. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Well, they didn't ask me to forgive them. Until they asked me to forgive them, I'm not going to forgive them. No. For Christ's sake, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll tell you what. 80% of the time, People are mad at other people. It's because of a scenario that's in their brain. It's not in reality. They construed what they said this way. They construed that they walked out that door when you walked in the building that way. They created this thing in their head that's made them angry and bitter at this person. And 80% is not true. And the 20% that is true, just forgive it. People are people. It's not about whether they're lovable. It's whether I love them no matter how unlovable they may be at this moment to me. And in bottom line, we just need to love just like Jesus did. So the conclusion on this is now that you are being the kind of person you need to be, you are able now to do the things like living in the peace of God which bring us into unity into the body. So we have been called into one body. Do you understand that? God didn't call you to be a Lone Ranger Christian. Okay? I'll have to admit, he did that to John the Baptist as a little boy. Hey, you're a Lone Ranger into the desert. I got a unique ministry for you to be this prophet and come out of the desert and proclaim Jesus, um, my son Jesus as the Messiah. There's people that called themselves into the desert, like Elijah, <laughs> until he literally was so depressed and he was laying in the desert just saying, God, kill me or I'm going to die. I'm just going to lay here until I die. God had to encourage him. He put himself in the desert. But guys, we're not to be lone ranger Christians. We were called in to Christianity. We were called to walk as Jesus walked. But in the same moment, we are called to be a part of the body of Christ. That takes effort, doesn't it? It takes work. Every relationship takes work. If you're living in the same house, you walk in that door, it takes work. Have you ever walked in the door at home and nobody's home? And you're like, ah, oh, this is wonderful. Oh, man. You know, and then you look at the text. Oh, I won't be home for two hours. You're going, woo hoo hoo two hours. Ah, ah. Why is that? Because people, no matter how wonderful the relationship is, it takes effort. It takes energy. But this is what we're called to. We're not called to not go to church. The Bible makes it clear we're not to forsake the gathering together of the brethren. We're not called not to you come together. I, I think that Christianity for the last hundred years or more has not really been right in the United States. And now it's failing, and I'm not so sure it's a bad idea. Because so many people were walking into a building, connecting with nobody, walking out in the middle of the final prayer, as they did, they wanted to get to their car without anybody talking to them. <laughs> it was like going to a movie theater. And it's like, I don't know if God even wants that. 
And now with social media and people have really learned that with the COVID couple of years, yeah, I, I actually don't have to go to the building. I can just watch it on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. And it's, it's identical. I know it is identical, but it shouldn't be. That's the way you were treating the church, like you were just live streaming. And you realize it's a lot easier for me to live stream than to physically go to a building where I don't connect with anybody. Because when I live stream, I also don't connect with anybody. I understand. But the problem was you were supposed to be connecting with people. And that was supposed to be meaningful. To this, you were called not just to be a Christian and be your own Lone Ranger Christian. And people ask you, you know, how's your walk with the Lord? Well, that's a personal thing. Me and God, it's just, you know, I'm a mass man and, you know, I got a friend, Tonto, and, and, you know, the three of us sort of do stuff together, but I really don't talk to anybody else about this. But then people in their minds, I mean, it's ridiculous. They want us to be here every Sunday, give financially to financially make this thing work, be in prayer, be in the spirit, have a band ready to go, have ushers ready to go, have Sunday school teachers ready to go so they can come to church three times a year for them. So they show up at Easter going, okay, guys, I'm here, feel privileged. And yes, I'm the owner of this place, and that's why I need all you employees to be here every week. So when I come at Easter, it's good. It's like if everybody was an Easter Christian like you, there would be no church. But there's a lot of people that do the once a month thing or every three week thing. And you're saying, What's, how can that happen? It's because they're not connecting. They don't, they don't understand that when they became a Christian, they're to become a part of the body of Christ. It takes work. It takes effort. Partly because we're all human beings. I mean, if I, if I wanted to mess with people, I'll just sit in the seat you sit in every week. What if I sat in your chair next week, Jenny? You'd be you'd like, ah, ah. Yeah, that's the kind of, that's, we're, just, we're just so simple that way. It's hard to crack, crack the shell on a new environment, whether that's the bowling league or the PTA meeting or a new neighborhood outside getting in. But as believers, we need to realize, no, 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 no. We, we need to make sure when we see people coming in, help them connect, help them be a part. How do we do that? He's going to talk about that, how we need to share. Boy, I laid a lot of verses out there for you to see that Paul repeats this constantly. In Romans 12, verse 4 and 5, I'm not going to read all these verses, but as we have many members, but what? One body. But all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13. For as one body is one, but has many members, also the members of that one body being many are one body, also is Christ. For by one spirit we've all been baptized into what? One body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, have been made to drink into the one spirit. And then in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 12, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body. How? Just as he pleases. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 20, I guess yeah, I'm going to read them all. But now, <laughs> indeed, there are many members, but yet what? One body. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 4, therefore, as prisoners of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called into the one hope of your calling. So we need to realize, whatever it takes, I'm going to bear all things, I'm going to connect, and I'm going to make the connection significant. When my kids were in my home at dinner time, I would always give them a vision on how to be a family and how to be a parent and how to be a, a friend. And I'd tell them, when you're with your friends, even if it's just for an hour, 
create a moment. Think ahead of time. When I was in high school, I would hang out with some guys. Some of them weren't even Christians. They had to go to your house and hang out. They'd come to the house, and I'm like, guys, have you ever read Ephesians 1? Let me just read this to you. And we would read it and start talking about it and created a moment. Maybe it's got a bunch of guys who will play basketball and, and, and do a little competition. Create a moment with basketball. That's fine. It, it doesn't always have to be spiritual things. But when we come to church, we want to create a moment. We want to, have, we want to leave church today being touched by connecting with Jesus in worship and in the word. But I, I today want to create a moment. I want to share with somebody what God's been sharing with me this week. Well, what's God been sharing with me this week? Oh, that, that, and that. Oh, that. I mean, look, what, what was that I read? Oh, yeah. Or maybe in the sermon today, God spoke to me. I'm going to, I want to speak that into at least three people's lives before I leave. You know what's on my heart today is I, I, God's really put on my heart to pray for at least three different people that God would, whatever, heal them, make them a witness, whatever. God put on my heart to get together with three or four people and pray for this person. I'm not sure why, but God's told me to pray for you and, and to get some brothers. We're going to anoint you with oil and pray for you. So when we come to church, we leave, and it's created a moment. People work to create a moment for me. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. But as for me, I was coming to create a moment for everybody else. Do you, do you see how it's not going to the movie, <laughs> hearing the sermon and leaving? It's, it's, I'm coming to serve. In essence, we're saying, I'm going to come and wash people's feet. I'm going to come and serve them. I'm going to come and bless them. And everybody is a unique member well, I'm not that spiritual. If, 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 I, I think I'm supposed to pray for that person, but if they're supposed to be prayed for, you know, Pastor Brian or Dennis, one of those real spiritual guys, well, God will lead them to do it. Me, I'm just a little peon. It doesn't work that way, does it? What did God say in the Psalms? Out of the mouth of babes, little children, little babies, I'll bring forth some of the greatest wisdom. I've had brand new Christians Share stuff with me out of the word. I'm like, whoa, God's hand is on this guy's life. He's been a Christian a week, and I've been one for 40 years, and I, I'm learning something from him right now, from his angle, from where he comes from. Well, of course, I should expect that. He's a unique person. So he's going to uniquely see the word and uniquely be used of God, and we need that hand, that foot, that ear, that eye. But all of us should come and realize I've been called to connect and to make that happen. And you, you know what's going to happen when you start doing that? You're going to go like, I'm, I'm not satisfied connecting with you Sunday morning. I think I'm going to get a, a, start a Bible study at my house. I, I just want to talk about Sunday sermon longer at my house. Let's see if people want to come and put it in the bulletin. Yeah, all of a sudden you got these people coming and sh talking about the sermon and I'll put together questions for you to, to answer. Hey, I just want to get together with a, a group of people and just read the Bible. That's it. We're just going to read through a whole book of the Bible. We're going to pray, read through a whole book of Bible and just talk about it every week. We're going to read through the whole Bible in a year together and I want to do that. Thursday nights works for me. You're going to find that you love these people. <laughs> you want to be with these people because when you start taking your treasure and putting it in them, they become valuable to you, right? When a, when a little first grader comes and says, oh, I drew this picture for you, Grandpa, you don't go, what the heck is that? <laughs> uh, well, thanks, and you wad it up and throw it in the trash can. You, you realize this, this is something that was in them, a treasure. And with all they had, they put it under this paper. And I realize that's, this is a treasure. And I put it on the refrigerator, right? So when we start putting our treasure where our heart, where our treasure is, what? 
their heart is also. And so when people are just trying to use the church as a movie theater, they, they don't find any treasure. And it's like, oh, why go back? I didn't, you know, I, 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 I could listen, you know, who needs Brian in Colossians 3? I can listen to Greg Laurie and Skip Heidsick and Chuck Smith and, you know, Chuck Swindoll and J. Vernon McGee. He's been dead 20 years, but I could listen to him and he's great. Yeah, it's not just about information, is it? There's an inspiration that God does when we're physically here and Jesus is here with us. If you come with that anticipation, every Sunday, I'm just crying out, God, don't let Satan hinder one and create a moment in everybody's life. Let the sermon just create a moment that they won't forget. And afterwards, I need to hear what God's speaking to you guys. You know, more importantly, the person next to you needs to hear what God's speaking to you. Let's create a moment. Let's wash one another in the water of the word. Let's pour out the spirit. And then what does he say? Be thankful. Do you know why God says we need to be thankful for this body of Christ? Because we're all very difficult. <laughs> Look at your calling. Not many honorable, not many noble amongst you. God's chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise. God taken the abased things of this world and raised them up in glory. That anybody who glories in us doesn't walk in here and say, wow, they're all so honorable. They're all so noble. They're all so rich. They're all, they all sing in perfect tune. How can I ever fit into that group? No, we're difficult. I'm difficult. You're difficult. And, and you know, this is why God has to command us to be thankful. <laughs> the Colossian church was commanded nonstop. In chapter 1, verse 3, we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance and the saints in light. Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith that you also have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And it goes on and on. several more times in the book of Colossians. I have those verses listed for you. The gratitude comes naturally to believers to respond to all that God has done. Paul talks about this outside of the book of Colossians. Every book, he, and he's like in Ephesians 5.20, he says, giving thanks always for all the things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.6, be anxious for nothing and everything with prayer, supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Let our requests be made unto God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, what? Give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Hebrews 13, 15, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifices of the praise of God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, you know, when we sing, guys, you say, oh, I don't feel like it. Well, it's a sacrifice. I don't like that song. I, it's a sacrifice. But we all come to realize we are singing as a sacrifice to God. It's not about me and what I like. It's interesting that the fruit singular of the Spirit is love, right? But what are the first two things in that pot <laughs> that make love? In Galatians 5.22, what is it? Joy and what? Peace. So when we come on one body, we're to command our soul to be thankful. Paul, David says, why am I you so cast down, oh, my soul? Trust in God. Rejoice in God. Thank the Lord for what he's done. The reason I'm cast down is that I'm all looking at my, I'm in the tunnel. I'm in, the, I'm in the, the bubble of my own fears and worries and concerns. And pop the bubble. Get out of there. Get your eyes on Jesus and look at all that he's done for you. These are troubling times. I have a message that I'm going to be sharing here in a few weeks on the end times. How do we know we're in the end times? You guys have been asking for that, so I'm going to do that. But I'm working on that, and I realize it's troubling. Jesus said it's troubling. But it's not to be disheartening. 
But as believers, we've got to realize we're probably, a lot of us in our lifetime, not you real, real old people, but you meet me old, old people like me, will probably end up going to jail for just believing water's wet. I mean, it's not going to take much. They just want you out of the way. And as soon as you say homosexuality is sin or, you know, God made two sexes, that's it. Oh, that's it. Put that guy in prison. I, I'm okay with that. I, 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 I was troubled by it, but I, I was also disheartened by it. But now I'm not disheartened by it. I'm troubled by it, but I'm just like, okay, I got a prison ministry. Well, my wife's going to have that's going to be hard. Yeah, that is going to be hard. But we, we end this world having a prison ministry until we die from getting beat up for believing Jesus is the Savior of all men, and then we go to heaven. I, I'm, I'm not troubled by it. I'm just still, still struggling, but it, it's okay. In this world, we'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. They're going to hate you, but I told you ahead of time that you're not stumbled. Let me, in the same way, those who don't believe in Christ don't have the peace of God by walking in the nature of Jesus. They don't have peace. They can't be thankful. Isn't that interesting? In Romans 121, that passage where it says men will go after men and women will go after women, it says before that, it says they, they will quit believing in God as creator and then it says in, in Romans 1.21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. And here's the real key. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Isn't that interesting? One of the signs of an unbeliever is he can't be thankful. One of the signs of a believer is they're always thankful. Rejoice in the Lord, always. <laughs> and in everything, give thanks. Because our eyes are on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I, success and prosperity, in my mind, is being loving in a hateful world. Being patient when everybody else is impatient. Being loving and caring and kind when everybody's being angry and irritable and mean. And I, I stood out and showed them Jesus in the midst of a dark world, whether they loved me for it or hated me for it. The spirit of humble gratitude towards God will inevitably affect our relationship with others. Peace and gratitude are thus closely linked, bringing peace into all our relationships. So if you're not joyfully thanking God and rejoicing in everything, you're probably not at peace. But when you're at peace, you're probably also thankful. And one brings the other. One encourages the other. And also, an attitude of gratitude contributes to an enjoyment of spiritual tranquility, whereas the opposite is also true, that in the grumbling makes for inner agitation. Well, verse 16 it goes on this way now. Number two. So the first, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Number two, the word of Christ dwell in you richly in verse 16. Let it happen again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace or thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. So let it happen. Let the word of Christ just Dwell in your heart. Meditate on it. Let the Holy Spirit bring it to mind over and over again. Boy, we could talk about this so much, can't we? The life of blessing and success comes from what? Meditating in the Word. I had a friend in college. He wasn't walking with the Lord at all, but God did a, a revival and a Bible study I was teaching, and this guy got on fire for the Lord. <clears throat> and he said, part of the reason I didn't follow the Lord is because my parents, they're just very strict Christians. And, and he goes, you should come home with me one, one e weekend. So I did. About an hour and a half away, we went to his house. He goes, I want to show you something. And he opened his dad's closet. And in there were two giant boxes of little cards. He's like, pull that out. I pulled out a bundle of cards. And all of them were Bible verses. He said, you could reach into that 
box, any one of those boxes, pull out and just randomly give a reference, and my dad can quote it by heart. Virtually, he's got the whole Bible memorized. And I thought, oh man, I got to meet this guy. I met this guy. He was the most irritable, angry, unhappy. I literally didn't make it through the weekend because it was just miserable being in that house. Because people are, are thinking, oh, read the Bible. It doesn't say read the Bible. Oh, memorize the Bible. You know, the Bible doesn't say memorize the Bible either. What does it say? Let it dwell in you richly. Mark Twain got it right. He said, it said, it's not part of the Bible that I don't know about that bothers me. It's the part that I do know. That part of the Bible that I know I should be obeying and doing. But I'm not. Let it dwell in your life. He who meditates in the word day and night, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, he'll prosper in all that he does. His leaf won't wither. Oh man, Joshua won the same thing. God's strength will go with you if you meditate. Don't let the word of God depart from your mouth. God will give you sure success. Life also, Jesus said, is sustained by the word. He said and answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You guys all take vitamins? I mean, I've been told to take this vitamin, that vitamin. I got so many vitamins now. I, every alphabet, every letter in the alphabet I got, it's, it's like something's got to change here. Well, here's another vitamin, the word of God. Jesus said, you can't make it. You're eating bread, you're eating in our burgers, you're working out, you got your physical world going, but yet God's made it that God's word is being ate up in your life and that's how you live. Our life doesn't, isn't made to exist. People are depressed and anxious and, and are suicidal because they're existing. No, we're to live a life in Christ and a big part of that is a spiritual life in the word. Man can't live by bread alone. The word of God guides us into right choices. Psalms 119, 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet, a light into my path. First Corinthians 4, 6, you may, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. It keeps us from sinning. Hide God's word in your heart. You won't sin against him. It causes us to win spiritual battles. You, are, you young men are strong and have overcome the evil one, Satan, because the word of God abides in you. Faith comes by hearing. How do we grow in our faith? Hearing by the word of God. It causes us to pray. I love this one in John 15, 7 and 8, where it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done. So as we abide in the word, we find ourselves also praying. It's interesting. We don't have to worry about praying if we are meditating in the word. If we're meditating in the word, God, as we meditate, it turns into prayer. The word, the very chewing on God's words turn into prayer. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. The word dwell is the word be at home. Literally, let the word of God... I, 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 I'm only comfortable when the word of God is in my heart, in my mind. Have you ever woke up at night and you're thinking about a scripture and meditating on it? I love that. Have you ever woke up in the middle of the night and you're praying? There was a season in my life where when I was in the middle of the night, I, I, had, I was praying with my hands up and even speaking in t tongues sometimes. And my roommate would say, hey, shh, Brian, wake up, wake up. Even, even I just love that where you're only at home if God's word is being meditated in your heart and let it happen abundantly or extravagantly. To do those things, the Christian must read, meditate, study, and live in the word. And then in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing. So positive and negative, the teaching, the positive, the admonishing or correcting and the negative, the word of God's to warn every man. And so again, God's given to the church leaders to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to edify the body of Christ till we come to that maturity that unity of faith well and we are then to be speaking that to what one another did you know that 
Your job this morning is to teach one another, to admonish one another. Are, are you doing that? Did you come with that in mind? Part of my job today is to share, to reiterate. Have you, have you, I've had people afterwards say to me, man, Ryan, that was such a good point when you shared this, this, and this. And I'm like, wow, I didn't say that, but man, that, that I should have said that was so, oh, that's the best part of the sermon. And I didn't even say it. And I've had people sh- share with each other going, man, I didn't hear that at all. I must have spaced out for a minute. But God speaks. And so this is what we do to one another. Well, verse 16, the second part, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another. In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with what? Grace or thankfulness in your heart to the Lord. So there's not this legalistic thing. There's not this uptight thing. Have you ever been to churches like that? Everybody's looking at what you wear. You didn't wear a tie. Oh, you wore a tie, but you didn't tie it right. Look at those shoes. That's not a godly pair of shoes. Look at that long hair. Obviously, you're not walking in obedience. It's like you can't wait to get out of there. Oh, I can be myself again. No, we don't, we don't want to be that. We, we want to be a place where it's almost poetic. It's almost musical. It's so freeing. As we're sharing the word, it's like poetry. It's like music. It's like this delightful worship. Man, what you just shared with me just causes my heart to rejoice. What you just shared causes my heart to sing. And then in verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, this is the third thing now, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. So guess what? There's no spiritual thing and there's no secular thing. There's a great little book called Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. And he found that when it was his turn in the monastery to pray, his mind went and it was just horrible. But when he was in cooking the food and cleaning the dishes, he had the best prayer time. And he wrote the little book that if you're out plowing, you're, you're out building a house, even in that, it's it can be spiritual. Sign a piece of wood and it's spiritual. <laughs> you're hammering some boards and it's spiritual. You're cleaning some pots and pans and, and you're, you're worshiping God and doing that. And this is what he's saying. It's not, I'm not saying be a body at church. I'm not saying, you know, Sunday mornings is it. <laughs> Somehow we've, can, we've told that to everybody. It's like, come Sunday morning. I don't care what you do the rest of the week, but Make, a, make me look good by coming Sunday morning. If a lot of you don't show up next week, it's going to make me look like this week's sermon wasn't good. And I, it really hurts my self-esteem. So I need you to come to church so I feel good about myself. Well, I don't, I don't want to disappoint Brian. I'll be there. What can God do with that kind of heart? The body of Christ is all weak, and it's not just Christians in our fellowship, is it? It's Christians in all kinds of different fellowships. And this is what he is saying, wherever you're at is prayer time. (laughs) Wherever you're at is the time to meditate in the word. Whatever you're doing is worship. Wherever you're at, Jesus is two or three gathered in your name. I'm I'm working at In-N-Out Burger cooking hamburgers, and there's a Christian next to me. We're at church, man. (laughs) It starts to get irritable. Hey, brother, I'm going to admonish you. Rejoice in the Lord always and everything give thanks. I just corrected you. This is what he's saying. It's, it's everywhere in every venue, and I love that. People don't know I am of my religion because of my cap I have on, because of my haircut with curly locks, because I got a big giant cross with Jesus on it. People know that we're Christians by our love for one another, right? This is what he's saying. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So even eating and drinking, let it all be done in the name of Jesus. And let that glorify 
the Father through him. That's where Jesus wants. He wants the Father to be glorified. So verse 15, to be thankful. And verse 16, sing with thanksgiving in our hearts to God. And now verse 17, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Isn't that radical? Jesus is saying, the Father loves you so much. Follow me and love on the Father. Follow me and act like me and glorify my Father who's in heaven. Men will see your good works and they'll glorify my Father is in heaven. How is this going to happen? He tells us through him, through Jesus. We don't have the power, do we? Even if I read the Bible, rejoice in the Lord always, do I have the power to do that? I don't. But if I'm hiding God's word in my heart, I will. Because Jesus is speaking his word and strengthening me in my heart, in my life. I, I'm all of a sudden full of bitterness. I can't get unbitter. Jesus, help me. Give me joy. Give me forgiveness. Give me love. Give me kindness that I don't have. I, 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 I'm, I'm not walking in the peace of God because I'm bitter and I can't stand it. Heal me. Help me. Cry out that I can be released from this bitterness. We can't do it. It's only in Christ, through his power and strength, it's possible. Amen, amen. Well, Lord, thank you for your word today. It's pretty awesome, Lord, when we realize that you didn't tell us to burn candles or get on our knees or go to a building or wear a necklace or go to a building or repeat these prayers or get on a rug and pray five times a day, are all these things that religion dictates that a man does that brings him in, out of the world and into bondage. But you just said walk. Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, it's spiritual because we're in you. And in you, we're living and moving and having our being. And now that we're daily putting off the things that are so easy, for our flesh, the anger, the irritableness, the, the lashing out, the self-centeredness, putting my interests first, wanting my needs met before everybody else's, and, and now becoming the servant of all men, just like you, Jesus. And it's all about them, loving them, shining as a light for them, speaking to them. That we would be in the word, not because we want to not be blackballed by you or be holy. We want to read the word because we want power to overcome sin. We want power to be filled with your spirit. We want the power to be lights and salt through your love, Jesus, that people would know your love that you gave to them by dying on the cross because of our words, because of our attitudes, because of the way we're walking. We want to be in the word richly dwelling and it's just to love on you just to bear fruit in, in heaven and, and to be this joyful, wonderful, peaceful witness to my family, my neighbors, the world. Lord, help us. We want this sanctification. We don't want to just be justified and have our name written in heaven. We want to walk in sanctification and have this fruitful, joyful, peaceful life that you've offered to those who would be a disciple and follow you. Just in your own heart right now, yes, Lord. I want to be a disciple. Yes, Lord. I want to follow you. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Amen.